to have you here, and we're delighted that it's a full house. You are in for a treat this evening. I want to introduce myself. I am Dr. Gerunda Hughes. I am the chairperson of the Charles Thompson Lecture Colloquium Committee, and this is my first year. Uh, I am um, following Dr. Aaron Stills. Stand up, Dr. Stills. Dr. Stills. <laughs> Dr. Stills retired last year, and uh, he passed this on to me. But as you can see, once you're a member of the Thompson Lecture Committee, you're always a member of the Thompson Lecture Committee. Sound man? Each of you received a packet when you came in. It consisted of the program, it consisted of a brochure, and it consisted of a complimentary copy of a Journal of Negro Education. We share this with you because, number one, we'd like for you to have a copy of the program, but we also wanted you to see the, the legacy and the history of the Thompson Lecture. Uh, over the last few years. The Thompson Lecture actually began in 1980, but we have a few of the examples that are there. You will also have in your packet a brochure that looks like this. And we would like to invite all of you, to the extent that you can, to support the work of the journal and the work of the lecture. And I'll talk about that a little bit later on. Before we begin tonight, and we invite our distinguished uh, lecturer up, Dr. Tyrone C. Howard from UCLA, I want to take what I call a Sankofa moment. Do you know what that is? We're going to take a trip back in history a little bit, and I wanted to uh, help you appreciate uh, some of the lectures that we have had in the past, so you could have a sense of the legacy of the Ta Charles Thompson Lecture. And as we look back, we can also look forward to our lecture tonight and the lectures that will be coming in the future. I've always had the privilege of introducing the speaker in the past. But tonight, I want to take this opportunity to introduce you to Charles Thompson. Now, if you look on the back of your program, you will see some information about Dr. Thompson. I want to point out a few things about him and share some uh, interesting uh, information about him that's not on the program. First of all, you can see that Dr. Thompson is from Jackson, Mississippi. He was born there. He is also, the, his parents were also educators. So interestingly, even though he was born in 1895, Charles Thompson was a second generation to go to college. He was also an only child. And he actually grew up on the campus of Jackson College. Now, you, if you look in the second paragraph, you will note that uh, Dr. Thompson was dean of what was called the College of Liberal Arts. Uh, when he was here at Howard University, and he was also dean of the graduate school. You notice, too, that they, he, it says that he was director of the first comprehensive self-study for uh, the university. Now, I, I want to put that in perspective a little bit. In 2008, Howard underwent a self-study for its accreditation, and I want to show you the document that we produced. This is what we produced in 2008. It's beautifully done, it's colored and everything. But now, I want to show you the document that Dr. Thompson produced in 1961 to 1966 for the self-study. <laughs> there were no word processors back then. You can imagine that this was typed on a on a, a, it's an electric typewriter. And the whole idea is he was very, very comprehensive. Anything that he did, he did it thoroughly. And so it doesn't surprise us that in 1932, 
He founded the Journal of Negro Education. By the way, we're going to make sure that that volume is placed in the Moreland Spingarn uh, Center of the Library. Now, I said I was going to take a Sankofa um, moment before we continue with the lecture. And I want to tell you about three distinguished lecturers in the past. But before I do that, I want you to see the pictures of the various lecturers that we've had over time. The last one is our lecturer for the night. The first one that I want to tell you about is Dr. Edmund Gordon. Dr. Gordon was an alum, a Howard alumnus of the class of 1942, and he delivered the fifth annual Charles Thompson lecture, which was titled Social Science Knowledge Production and Minority Experiences. In his opening comments, Dr. Gordon stated that, quote, the social sciences have a long tradition searching for universal principles which explain the relationships among social experiences and individual group and systemic characteristics. However, alongside that long tradition is a long history of concern that sufficient attention had not been given to the impact of unique cultural ethnic or gender experiences on the development of behavior and social systems by which behavior is expressed. This neglect, he said, is sometimes resulted in knowledge reduction and utilization of negative consequences for the life experience of some groups, specifically African Americans, who have been inappropriately represented in the development of social science knowledge. Furthermore, the problem becomes compounded when we recognize that many of the core propositions upon which the social sciences rest, such as objectivity, positivism, and empiricism, are culture-bound, and therefore are potentially more limited in their explanatory usefulness than is generally presumed. He then left us with a cautionary note that all social science researchers must remember, and that is this. In many ways, social science theories have situational and temporal utility. What that means is that context and the time in which these experiences occur are limited. And in many cases, the observations that we think are universal are not universal at all. Now I'm going to skip one because we want to get right to the lecture, and I want to share you, with you uh, just one last one from my mentor, Dr. Sylvia Johnson. Dr. Johnson's lecture was in 2000. As we entered a new century and a millennium, the 2000 lecture was called The Live Creature and Its Expectation for the Future. It was supposed to be delivered by Dr. Johnson. I call that particular Charles Thompson lecture a trifecta, and this is why I say that. Dr. Johnson was a Howard University alumna. She was a faculty member here at Howard, She's a professor in the Department of Human Development and Psychoeducational Studies, and at the time, she was also editor-in-chief of the Journal of Negro Education. She was nationally known for her work in educational measurement and assessment and a mentor extraordinaire to many Howard University graduates, including yours truly. While her footsteps are too big to feel, many of us try to position ourselves in places and spaces where we try to influence assessment issues related to equity and fairness in assessment, validity of interpretations and uses of assessment results, and the effect of these on both students and teachers. In the journal article that captured the, ex the essence of her lecture, Dr. Johnson talked about the meaning of test scores and how cultural factors are involved in understanding their meaning. In fact, when it comes to high-stakes testing and scores that result, she said this, 
A major feature in nearly all school reform is the heavy reliance on high stakes tests for accountability and decision making. These tests are often advertised as being designed to assess rigorous curriculum standards. For those of you who are familiar with Common Core, you know what I mean, right? But she said, far from attention to typically given to match standards and tests, the essential thing is missing. And that is the match between the standards and instruction for all students being assessed. As a result, the available test products serve mainly institutional needs, offering little benefit to test takers, teachers, or even schools in terms of prescriptive information or inst instructional value. The latter point is of special interest because often much time, much valuable instructional time, is devoted to test preparation exercises that have little use in the development of substantive problem solving, reasoning, and higher order thinking skills. And I know that many of us, many of you, can relate to that. Both of these lectures and the articles that follow can be found in the Journal of Negro Education. And I encourage all of you to find those articles and to read the complete text. Now, we will con continue with the uh, program. And in that regard, I'd like to introduce our Dean, Dean Leslie Finwick. And then the program will proceed as it is printed. Thank you very much. Good evening. I know you are all eager to hear from Dr. Tyrone Howard, and so I have about two and a half minutes worth of remarks here. I first want to acknowledge the committee, the Charles Thompson Lecture Committee, that brings us together um, this evening. If those faculty would please stand. Thank you for your work. Thank you. Year after year, these faculty bring us exceptional scholars. The second group I'm going to ask to stand is the School of Education faculty. These are the faculty who have been the consistent guardians of this lecture. And um, I cannot go forward without um, mentioning several special guests. I'm pleased to see Dean Emeritus of the College of Arts and Sciences here, Dr. James Donaldson. Dr. Melanie Carter, who is the Associate Provost for Undergraduate Studies, to my left here. And also a School of Education faculty member, Dr. Wade Boykin, whose work you know through um, CRESPAR and the Capstone Institute. And our own Dr. Faustine Jones-Wilson, who's in the front row, who's a former editor-in-chief of the Journal of Negro Education and also served as interim dean of the School of Education. Thank you for being here. You've heard from Dr. Hughes that in 1932, Charles Thompson founded the Journal of Negro Education because he believed that research conducted by black scholars could and would dispel pervasive myths about black intellectual and social inferiority. Only six years after earning his PhD from the University of Chicago in 1926, Thompson created JNE, as it's affectionately called, to be the nation's premier scholarly publication devoted to issues incident to blacks throughout the diaspora. Ever since its establishment, JNE has been in the business of myth busting. Let me provide you a sample of some of the myth busting research found in JNE. The answers that you're going to hear to the four questions I'm going to ask you are directly oppositional to how blacks have been portrayed in the mainstream media and research. But JNE has always, since 1962, been about correcting that record. So very quickly, and I'm going to go through these very quickly, um, I'd like all the black men in the room to stand very quickly. And while you're standing, I want you all to answer this question. Are there more black men in college or in prison? There are more black men in college than in prison. Will you say that, black men? There are more black men in college than in? There are more black men in than in? 
you will walk outside on Georgia Avenue or through the center and hear someone say just the opposite, whether it's being broadcast on CNN or C-SPAN, it's incorrect information. There are 1.4 black men in college and about 840,000 black men in prison. That's too many black men in prison. But our own Dr. Ivory Tolson, who is currently the editor of the Journal of Negro Education, corrected that record. This is why if you don't have a subscription to J&E, you need one. Thank you, gentlemen. Number two, will all the black parents in the room please stand? Is there anybody who's a parent? Please stand. Okay. <laughs> what percentage of black parents report setting aside a special time and place for their child to complete homework and have an adult in the household check that homework? About 90%. There you go. It's 89%. The parents can be seated. 89% of black parents engage in these school-affirming behaviors. This is the highest demographic of any subgroup of American parents of school-age children. So why do we mainly in read in the research about lack of black parental involvement in schooling? Will the black teachers and principals in the room please stand? All right. <laughs> Just one, two. Three, four. Black teachers and principals. Black, who are the nation's most credentialed and experienced educators by racial or ethnic demographic? Well, I'm on a roll here. Black teachers and principals and superintendents are more, we are, we are. Black teachers, principals, and superintendents are more likely to hold a doctorate and possess more years of professional experiences than their white peers, particularly when they ascend to the principalship and superintendency. Yet fewer than 7% of the nation's teachers and fewer than 3% of the nation's 14,000 superintendents are African American. This is one reason why the School of Education, in collaboration with our partner, the American Association of School Administrators, just established an urban superintendents academy. And this is the last question. Will any criminal justice, political science, faculty, or students please stand? If you're in criminal justice, political science, if you're a faculty or a student. My question is, what is the demographic profile of a crack cocaine user? I'm hearing several answers. Here's the data, 62% of crack cocaine usages by whites and 72% of powder cocaine usages by whites. 62% of crack cocaine usages by whites, 72% of powder cocaine usages by whites. Although frequently characterized as a drug of the black community, 60% of the individuals who have used crack cocaine in the last month are white. And in fact, white crack cocaine users also account for 60% of the individuals who have ever used crack in their lifetime. Simply stated, the majority of crack cocaine usage in this country is by whites. Despite this reality, 80% of the people arrested for crack offenses in 2002 were black at rates 10 times higher than that of whites. You can be seated. All of this is related, these questions and the answers that I provided are found in the Journal of Negro Education. The theme for this evening, Black Lives Matter, um, Dr. Howard's uh, lecture is partially titled that, Black Lives Do Matter. And because our lives matter, we must know and propagate the truth about the black community. We as a community of scholars, Howard University scholars and activists must interrupt this litany of negative misinformation that pours from researchers and journalists' keyboards about us and fuels and even tacitly justifies the brutality from thugs masquerading as police officers that we are witnessing almost every day on TV. We, Howard University scholar activists, must strike our keyboards, conduct empowering research, correct the record, dispel the lies, educate ourselves about ourselves, and raise the truth to progressive other communities. This is what the Charles Thompson lecture series is intended to do. This is what Charles Thompson intended in 1932 when he founded the Journal of Negro Education, and now today, in 2015, we remain anchored to this legacy through JNE and through this lecture series. Dr. Howard, we welcome you to this Howard University tradition 
a tradition that rights what is wrong and ushers in the moral high ground. And we thank you for being a scholar warrior. Welcome to Howard University. Good evening. Let me say that again. Good evening. Good evening. I'm going to welcome you here to the 36th Annual Charles Thompson Lecture. And I'm sending these welcomes to you from the Journal of Negro Education. My name is Linda Hill, and I'm the associate editor of the journal founded by our Dr. Thompson. In his first editorial, Dr. Thompson wrote that the journal needed, was needed because we were not adequately discussed, researched, or factually or critically appraised in other publications. But no one was willing to take on that responsibility until he, in a small group of advisors, took that leap of faith. I want to thank Dr. Thompson for his vision. And I want to thank those editors in chief who came after him. And I'd like to thank one woman who I see as a gem to the journal and has served as an editor in chief. And that is Dr. Faustine Jones Wilson who has been mentioned earlier. She has been an editorial mentor to me during my 10 years here as associate editor. And um, I don't know if many of you realize what the associate editor does for a journal, but my role is to make sure that all the T's are crossed and all the words are said in the appropriate way. And that all the research has actually been checked and rechecked. And that the words are proofread. And then I format, lay out, and submit the copy to a typesetter. It is probably one of the most thankless jobs, but I get so much joy and thrill from doing it. And I get so many thanks and acknowledgments from authors and editors for my work of what I am very proud of. I'd like to thank the School of Education for their support and Dean Fenwick, who has supported the journal to reach new heights. I would like to thank the past and current editorial bo board members who continue to keep the journal lively and on point. So much so, with all of their insistence in having an impact factor for the journal, that the journal in 2016 will be included in the journal citation report for, its, for, for the first time, where we will have a journal impact factor. And for those who do not know what, a, what JCR is, it's a recognized authority for evaluating journals and comparing them to journals international-wide. So we're very excited that the Journal of Negro Education is being included. Also in 2016, we'll be publishing an issue on black women and girls, something that the board members, too, were enthusiastic about and we're wondering when we were going to do another issue. 
Well, 15 years later, here it is. We will be doing that for our summer special issue in 2016. I'd like to thank all of our peer reviewers for their support and encouragement. And I especially want to thank Ms. Joseph and our graduate assistant, Vanessa Baptiste, for their work, support, and prayers as we handle the day-to-day -day responsibilities of getting the journal done and working in the journal office. JNE is still relevant, and it is still relevant because of all of your support. We must continue to keep it relevant. So all you young educators and researchers out there, you need to take the reins and do as I mentioned in the legacy issue. Publish your research and have your books reviewed in the Journal of Negro Education, which will lead us to the celebration of 100 years of publishing in 2032. Thank you so much. Well, good evening. My name is Kenneth Alonzo Anderson. I'm department chair and associate professor in the Department of Curriculum Instruction in the School of Education. And I have the privilege and duty to introduce our distinguished speaker on tonight. Before I read his biography, I want to say a few words about how I came to know Dr. Howard. So Dr. Howard has a cousin by the name of Keith Howard, who we uh, were in the struggle together in graduate school. So um, some of you all are in that now. And um, so Dr. Howard and Keith are very, uh, Dr. now Keith Howard and Dr. Tyrone Howard are very close. So Dr. Howard had to adopt me without his permission as a mentor. And uh, one of the things I appreciate about Dr. Howard is that although he's, he's an astute scholar, he's more than that. He causes you to think. He really introduces discourse and engages and encourages discourse but he does it in a way that's accessible and a way that matters. He's not this ivory tower professor. And one of the things I appreciate about him, you'll see in his writing, it comes across as a parent, as a black male, and as a scholar, and especially a parent of a black male. So those things are real lived experiences that he, talk about, he talks about when he writes. So I'll take a moment to read his biography, and then I'll say a couple more words, having the same coastal moment as Dr. Hughes did, and then we'll have our distinguished guest. So if you want to follow along with me in your bulletin, <coughs> Professor Tyrone C. Howard is a professor of education at the University of California, Los Angeles, known as UCLA, in the Graduate School of Education and Information Studies, Urban School and Division. He's the Associate Dean for Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion. He's also the director and the founder of the Black Male Institute at UCLA, which is an interdisciplinary cadre of scholars, practitioners, community members, and policymakers dedicated to improving the educational experiences and life chances of black males. Professor Howard's research is primarily concerned with the academic achievement of youth in urban schools. His work has centered on the achievement gap facing African American and culturally diverse students, and the importance of providing teachers the skills and knowledge to assist them in reversing persistent underachievement. Dr. Howard has been a member of the UCLA faculty for, four, for the past 14 years. Prior to his tenure at UCLA, he was a faculty member in the College of Education at The Ohio State University. Before entering higher education, Dr. Howard was a classroom teacher in the Compton Unified School District, a native of Compton, California. Dr. Howard, is one, Dr. Howard is one of the foremost experts on race, culture, teaching, and learning in urban schools. His book, Race, Culture, and the Achievement Gap, a Teachers College Press bestseller, examines the, role, the roles that race and culture play in explaining educational outcomes. 
Dr. Howard's new book, Black Male, Peril and Promise in the Education of African American Males, examines the lives and identities of African American males in diverse contexts has, and has recently become a bestseller. Professor Howard has been a contributor on National Public Radio, CBS, KCAL News, the Los Angeles Times, the Huffington Post, and is also a contributor to the New York Times Educational Issues Forum. Dr. Howard has published over 75 peer-reviewed journal articles, book chapters, encyclopedia entree entries, and technical reports. Dr. Howard is, uh, is the recipient of the 2005 UCLA Distinguished Faculty Award, the highest honor bestowed for teaching ex excellence at the university. He was also recently awarded a Lifetime Achievement Award for exemplary research on diversity by the American Education Research Association, the nation's largest and most prestigious education research organization. Dr. Howard is con considered one of the, most, the foremost thinkers of race, equity, access, and education in the country. I think that's worthy of a round of applause. So before we bring Dr. Howard up to perform his lecture entitled, Why Black Lives Matter, Race, Gender, and Freedom Schools in the Quest for Educational Equity, I'd like to take about two minutes to talk about history. We've all talked about 1932. Here's an excerpt from the journal in 1932. In 1932, one of the journal's most formidable scholars, W.E.B. Du Bois, wrote, there are times when one must stand up for principle at the cost of discomfort, harm, and death. But in the case of the education of, young, of the young, you must consider not simply yourself, but the children and the relation of children to life. Fast forward 40 years later, in 1971, one of DC's own, arguably one of the most influential poets of the 20th century. Penned about four or five stanzas. Hopefully you know these stanzas. Mother, mother, there are too many of you crying. Brother, 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 there are far too many of you dying. You know we've got to find a way to bring some loving here today. Father, Father, we don't need to escalate. War is not the answer, for only love can conquer hate. You know we've got to find a way to bring some love in here today. Picket lines and picket signs don't punish me with brutality. Talk to me so you can see. Mother, mother, everybody thinks we're wrong. Oh, but who are they to judge us? Simply because our hair is long. Oh, you know, we've got to find a way to bring some understanding here today. Dr. Howard, what's going on? Nobody told me we were going to have Marvin Gaye going on here tonight. I appreciate that, Dr. Anderson. Thank you so much. Good evening, Howard University. Come on now, you can do a little bit better than that. Good evening, Howard University. How are we doing? All right, it is my privilege, uh, my distinct honor to be here in your presence this evening. Um, I'm big on acknowledgments. I cannot say thank you enough for all the folks who made this possible. I want to say thank you to Dean Fenwick. Uh, for your leadership of this fine institution. Uh, I want to say thank you to everyone who, were, who was part of the committee, the Thompson Lecture Colloquium Committee, to have me here. Uh, this lecture is, is important. I hope that all the students here recognize that you are in the midst of something that doesn't happen everywhere. This is really special. Uh, I oftentimes have to pinch myself because I remember not too long ago, well, maybe it was a long time ago, when I was a student and I used to read the Negro the Journal of Negro Education, uh, and I would read about uh, the Thompson Lecture. 
Uh, so it's somewhat just surreal to think now here I am giving this lecture. And my hunch tells me someone in this audience today, while you may not realize it, will be up on this podium in the next decade or two giving this similar kind of lecture because you never know what this is all about. You never know the path where you're going to un unfold. So I want to say uh, thank you to the committee. I also want to say thank you to many of uh, my dear friends and colleagues who are here, Dr. Anderson, with the warm introduction. Uh, I am honored to folks like Dr. Faustine uh, Jones-Wilson and, and the work she has done. Uh, I'll also have another uh, of, of colleague, Dr. Wade Boykin, uh, Dr. Melanie Carter, who is here, Dr. Freeman. There are a number of folks here who I'm indebted to their leadership and their scholarship. So thank you, thank you, thank you for this opportunity. Um, I say this all the time. I, I, I don't know how and why I'm here. I'm a big head little boy from Compton who's standing up here now doing this. You never know. Uh, is Compton in the house? Somebody over here said it, right? Yeah. We, we're not ashamed to claim our roots, right? OK. Um, I want to talk to you today about uh, a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And I hope that in many ways this serves as, a, as, a, as an inspiration for you to think about uh, why we have to be more resolved in the work we do around issues of educational equity and really educational justice. Um, but before I do, I want to build on what Dr. Hughes did. I want to thank Dr. Hughes also uh, for the work she did and my being here. Uh, she talked about Dr. Um, Charles Thompson. Um, it's important to understand the historical legacy upon which we stand, and I think Dr. Thompson is one of those educational pioneers we should all know about. If you take a little time to read about his bio, you would learn that he was the first African American to earn a PhD in educational psychology. You would understand that he spent 40 years here at this fine institution fighting, leading, thinking, researching on issues tied to black education. And let me tell you why the establishment of the Journal of Negro Education is important. Because we have to understand that for years, years before there was a Journal of Negro Education, mainstream journals attempted to define us. Mainstream journals attempted to tell our story. Mainstream journals attempted to control our narrative. Uh, you never want to have someone else control your narrative. Dr. Thompson understood that. You never want someone else to control your journey. Dr. Thompson understood that. Because when others control your narrative, when others control the way your story is told, they oftentimes pathologize us and see all the things that are not right about us. What the Journal of Negro Education has done, no, you can, you can acknowledge it, right? What the Journal of Negro Education did was said that, you know what? The mainstream account of our story is not the accurate account of our story. And Dr. Thompson provided an outlet to say that we are not pathological, we are full of promise and potential. And he told the story in ways that we know the story best. So if there's anything I would tell the young folks here today is always control your narrative. Because if you do not, you are at the whim of others' accounts of you. And oftentimes, that account is not the most accurate. So we are indebted to folks like Dr. Charles Thompson because he understood the importance of us controlling our own narrative. So we have to make sure we always honor, recognize, and respect the work of those folks who we stand on the shoulders of. So can we acknowledge Dr. Charles Thompson one more time, please? So I want to give you this overview of what I want to talk about with you today. I want to, I want to really touch on three key points, three, three essential takeaways I want you to have when you leave here um, shortly. Uh, I want to start off by talking about the, the, the importance of the black lives, and I am going to push this idea of black minds mattering as well. Uh, and I'm going to then tie that into the, what I'm referring to or talking about as the over-policing of black children's bodies in schools. And then I want to follow that up by talking about literacy as a human rights issue and talk about this through the context of freedom schools, which I think in some ways offers us a much more transformative way of thinking about educational equity and educational justice for black children. So I want to start off around Black Lives Matter. And I want to just give you some context here because we have heard this hashtag for the last year or so, but I want to give a little backdrop here. So in 2013, in response to the preponderance of violence and unaccounted for destruction of black lives in the United States, Black Lives Matter was born. Black Lives Matter has become an internationally politically driven activist movement that campaigns, organizes, and mobilizes against violence towards black people. Black Lives Matter regularly protects the shootings or protests the shootings of black people at the hands of police and police brutality that has been rampant in the country for centuries but have become increasingly visible over the past two decades in what is purported to be a civil and democratic society. The Black Lives Matter movement 
began with one of the, the uses of the hashtag Black Lives Matter on social media and it really became more prominent after the acquittal of George Zimmerman and the shooting death of African American teenager Trayvon Martin. The movement has gained even more momentum since 2014 with the deaths of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri, Eric Garner in New York City, Tamir Rice in Cleveland, Ohio, and Ezell Ford in Los Angeles, California. What's important to understand is that several other unfortunate deaths of African Americans at the hands of police officers have had their deaths protested by the movement. The movement. This is your time, this is your opportunity. Black Lives Movement has said that it's more than a moment, it is a movement. They have said they are unapologetically black. They are intersectional, intergenerational, family affirming, queer affirming, woman affirming, empathetic and global. It's important to understand the significance of this movement because what Black Lives Matter is saying is that we should not have to apologize for seeking justice for black people. By no stretch of the imagination does this mean that we're not concerned about the issues that affect Latinos. It doesn't mean that issues that affect Asian Americans or Native Americans aren't important. It doesn't mean that the issues that affect white Americans aren't important. But for one time, when we see the kind of injustice that's occurring with black lives, we should be unapologetic to say that these lives matter. And we should be OK to put the spotlight on black lives and say what is happening to black people in this country is oftentimes very unique compared to any other group of people that we are seeing at this point in time. So what Black Lives Matter does, it says, it gives us the platform to say it is OK to advocate on behalf of those who are oftentimes most unadvocated for. So understand, when we talk about Black Lives Movement, if you go to its website, what it talks about is that it is, quote, a unique contribution that goes beyond extrajudicial killings of black people by police and vigilantes, they say. Part of what Black Lives Matter tells us is that it seeks to affirm the lives of black people, black queer, black trans folks, black disabled folks, black, un black undocumented folks, folks with records, women, and all black lives along the gender spectrum. What Black Lives Movement has done is give us a platform to say we are not a monolithic people. We have lots of background, lots of experiences. We're talking about immigration or our sexual orientation. We're talking about the full spectrum of black life in 2015 and that all those lives matter. They should not be marginalized. Moreover, what Black Lives Matter tells us is that when we say Black Lives Matter, we're talking about the ways in which black people are deprived of our basic human rights and dignity. It is an acknowledgment that black poverty and genocide is, quote, a state of violence. And part of what we need to recognize is that stance needs to be reminded on a regular basis of why we advocate on behalf of black people, because we have had this long history of being told that we should be part of a larger multicultural agenda part of a larger diversity agenda. Those are all important, but typically what happens when we become part of the larger multicultural agenda, we get lost in that analysis. We are the first ones on the front lines, but oftentimes the ones who are quickly pushed to the back. So what Black Lives Matter tells us is it's OK to be at the front and say these are issues that are affecting us in ways that they are not impacting any other population of folks. So understand we talk about Black Lives Matter that what we have to recognize is that this is playing out in different ways in schools across the country. Hence, we have to recognize in many ways black minds matter as well, because what Black Lives Matter says is that they're, com they're committed to this idea that we are seeking to end oppression in the most discomforting places and spaces across this country, and you can make a strong argument that perhaps outside of penal institutions, there's no place where black people seemingly are experiencing discomfort than in schools across this country. And so this is why we have to talk about Black Lives Matter within the context of education. I will not bore you with a whole lot of details and statistics, but just, as, just to take a snapshot of some of the data we know about black children in this country. Least likely to have access to, quali to qualified, high quality childhood education. Dismal reading and test school, or, or math and reading scores, which I'll talk about in a moment. Most likely to be in classrooms with unprepared, undertrained classroom teachers most likely to be retained, most likely to be suspended and expelled, among the lowest graduation, lowest graduation rates of any subgroup and least likely to go to and complete four-year college institutions. So again, part of what we have to recognize is that this picture of who we are and how we have experienced schools is not ideal. It's not optimal. 
And we have got to begin to say that black lives matter because when it comes to educational institutions, these institutions are not serving the needs of black children. Now, what I would like to do is for us to recognize that while we talk about black lives matter, black minds matter too. Black bodies matter as well. And what we are recognizing is far too many black bodies are being treated as if they are less than human. To that end, I take you to this clip right here. Uh, I cannot even watch the video anymore because it is so gruesome of what happened to a young 16-year-old black girl in South Carolina. Part of what we have to understand, if we're going to advocate for black lives mattering, we have to talk about what this looks like in the context of schools. This picture takes us to the recent videotaping of school police officer Ben Field slamming a young high school student in a South Carolina classroom, which we know garnered national attention. While Officer Fields was subsequently arrested, was subsequently fired, it once again raises the question about the appropriateness of policing in U.S. schools and policing in particular of black bodies in U.S. schools. While issues of safety are oftentimes given to us as the reason for why there's such a presence of officers in schools, what we see is that individuals such as Officer Fields, who's pictured here, it's not only playing the role of judge and jury, but playing the role oftentimes of executioner when it comes to how black bodies are seen as being less than human. Part of what we have to know, if we examine the case of Officer Fields, we know that this situation was not his first where he had engaged in egregious conduct with black children. In 2013, there was a federal lawsuit against Officer Fields that claimed he, quote, unfairly and recklessly targeted African American students with allegations of gang membership and criminal gang activity. So this is not an aberration we saw with Officer Fields here. And if we're saying black lives matter, we have to be, be willing to put the spotlight on those who violate black bodies in the name of education every single day. So some might ask, why such a heavy presence of police in US schools? It's a good, great question. These are supposed to be learning institutions, not institutions of around punishment and discipline. According to the National Center of Educational Statistics, some 43% of U.S. public schools, including 63% of middle schools and 64% of high schools, have police officers on their grounds in 2013-2014. This includes more than 46,000 full-time and 36,000 part-time police officers. But what we know is that disproportionate numbers of police officers find themselves on campuses where there are large numbers of African-American students present. Now, what we need to understand is the larger subtext upon which we see the number of police presence taking place. This whole sort of proliferation of police officers in schools started back in 1999 after the Columbine shooting in Colorado. And at that time, there was a, a big push to find this idea of no or zero tolerance on schools. So we increased police presence to stop the spate of school shootings that were occurring in places like Paducah, Kentucky, places like Medford, Oregon. So as schools across the country began to buffer up their police presence, something quite interesting became quite prevalent, is that the very schools where the shootings were occurring, which by and large were predominantly white, largely, er, largely rural and oftentimes suburban, did not see the kind of police presence like urban schools did. So why if we have a spate of school shootings in, in rural schools across America, do we send all the police presence to urban schools in this country? That would be like having the Saudis attack your country, but then go into war in Iraq. That sound familiar to folks? It just doesn't add up, right? You don't go one place to do damage when you know that the presence of violence is someplace else. So part of what I want us to understand around this issue in South Carolina is that there's oftentimes a, a fuller story that we don't hear. And I talked about Dr. Thompson and the importance of controlling the narrative. And so in the spirit of controlling our narrative and talking about Black Lives Matter, what I want us to understand is this idea that recently there was an article that came out in The New Yorker. And the article in The New Yorker was from young Naya Kenny. And if you saw the videotape of what happened in that South Carolina classroom, there were three different students who took out their cell phones and captured what was happening in that incident. See, this is one of the reasons why I'm, I'm fighting more and more educators to say we should allow cell phones in the classroom, not disallow them in the classroom. Because see, part of what we have to recognize is much of what happened to this young girl in South Carolina has been happening long before. We just could not capture it, right? What Black Lives Matter has told us is that police brutality is not new in our communities, right? 
We have known for decades on end that police brutality was real. We would give our accounts to police officers, give our accounts to the departments. They would say that could not have happened. It was only when we were able to capture these moments on video that we were vindicated. Now that is happening in classrooms across America. So part of what I want us to understand, this article in The New Yorker talked about what young Naya Kinney saw on that moment, during that day, because this gives a different account of the story. So part of what we need to understand is that in research, we need to listen to those students and those voices that are typically not heard, those on the margins. Young Naya Kinney was in that same classroom, and she gives an account that we need to take listen, we need to listen to because it offers us insight. So what she says here is that when the young girl who was ultimately slammed was not willing to cooperate with the teacher, they called the resource officer. Young Naya Kinney said that we have two, and I didn't know which one was coming, she told her state newspaper. She said, then she saw Officer Fields, and she said, quote, I told them, referring to her classmates, to get their cameras out because we know his reputation, or I know his reputation, right? So again, this was not a first time accounting with Officer Fields, right? She knew when he, she saw him walk into the classroom that the phones needed to come out because something that might happen would not be something that was appropriate, okay? She goes on. As she saw the situation unfolding, she says, I couldn't believe what was happening, right? She goes on to say that as she began to speak out in protest against what Officer Fields was doing to the young girl, he then told her, quote, since you have so much to, to say, you're coming too. You want some of this? These were Officer Fields' wor words to young Naya Kenny. And at that point, she says, he just put my hands behind my back, and subsequently, both girls were arrested. Again, one for defiance, supposedly, and young Naya Kinney for merely videotaping what was happening in the classroom and offering objection to what was taking place to her classmate. Now, if you watch the video, one of the things that's most disturbing to me is that if you watch it several times over, what this officer does to, to the young girl, no one else seems to respond in any kind of sort of outrage. There are students who are around who are just acting as if they don't see it. I guess where I was also disappointed, I mean, number one, my disappointment was with the officer, but the classroom teacher is saying it the entire time, and he never moves. So it raises the question about how we talk about sort of the police and the black bodies and how some people are completely okay and acceptable with those black bodies being treated as less than human. Now, we live in a country that oftentimes, if we had seen someone on the street taking their dog and slamming their dog down, we'd be ready to arrest that person. But here you have a young 16-year-old child being treated that way, and there's oftentimes no response as if there's anything wrong. That's why we have to talk about why black lives matter, right? That was not a young white girl who was being slammed like that. And we can only venture to think what would happen if she had been resistant in that fashion. So now we have two young girls, and this is where young Naya Kinney needs to be recognized for her courage, because she spoke out. She said, this was not right. Why are you doing this? Something's wrong with this picture. And when she spoke out, she was subsequently arrested, right? So we have to send the message that we are going to support those young people who are willing to stand up in the face of adversity when they see it, OK? Let's continue on, because part of what we realize is that in South Carolina, disrupting school is a crime. Let me say that one more time. In South Carolina, disrupting school is a crime. If you didn't get it, I'll say it one more time. In South Carolina, disrupting school is a crime. If disrupting school was a crime when I was young, growing up in Compton, there'd be a whole lot of folks not here today, right? If disrupting school was a crime and where many of you probably grew up, some of us wouldn't be here today, right? But understand what is happening in South Carolina is that now disrupting school, which is highly subjective, highly subjective, it's now a crime that is a misdemeanor carrying a possible penalty of 90 days imprisonment or a $1,000 fine. Understand that we are now not decriminalizing school discipline, we are criminalizing school discipline, where children can be arrested, jailed, fined for what teachers consider to be disruptive behavior. Right? Now, we have a full gamut of research that tells us, and Dr. Boykin is here, he talks about it, that oftentimes for black children, our levels of just being who we are doesn't fit into the very social norms that the schools define as what's considered acceptable. So oftentimes, we have black children just being who they are. Culturally, we are unique. Culturally, we are different. But oftentimes, those cultural differences get manifested as being problems, as being defiant, as being disruptive. Now we see in states like South Carolina, it's a penalty, it's a crime. 
Moreover, the sheriff of the city where this took place says, quote, in referring to the young girl whose name we still don't know, right? He says, quote, she wasn't doing what the other students were doing. He, referring to the teacher, was trying to teach. She was preventing that from happening and not paying attention. So now paying attention falls under the umbrella of disruptive behavior and can be penalized. So I want us to understand why we have to talk about the policing of black bodies and why black lives, black minds matter, because the message we keep receiving is that these bodies, these minds don't matter as much as others. And so finally, Officer Fields has been fired. There was a big protest in support of rehiring him that happened just a couple, about a week or so ago. But Sheriff Leon Lott, who is the sheriff in, the, in Columbia, South Carolina, where this took place, in announcing the decision, made a point of saying that the teacher and the administrator supported Officer Fields' actions. Quote, even the physical part. They had no problems with the physical part, they said. The sheriff, however, did say that he had a problem with the fact that Fields didn't use the, quote, proper technique. So it's not that so much he had an issue with her being slammed to the ground. It was just the technique that was used to slam her was not appropriate. So this is the kind of discourse that happens that begins to tell us that certain bodies and certain minds don't seem to matter. And while we have to be unapologetic in our advocacy for what is happening for young people who look like the young girl in South Carolina. So now what I want us to understand as we talk about this is that this is not the only case. And we have to ask, how do we respond? Because there's a litany of cases where young black bodies are being treated as adults. And part of what we know is that in the South Carolina town where this happened, 59% of the students are black, 26% are white, yet 87% of those who were suspended were black in 2011, 2012. And South Carolina relies much more on suspension than the nation as a whole, where 24% of public school students in the state were suspended at least once compared to the national average of 13%. And now there is a growing list of cases of young children being arrested. Recently in Round Rock High School in Austin, Texas, a young 14-year-old was grabbed by the throat and dragged to the ground by a police officer for being quote unquote defiant. In Birmingham, Alabama, Woodland High School authorities discovered that between 2006 and 2011, police repeatedly pepper sprayed students for infractions as minor as back talking and challenging authority. The officers then failed to follow the legal requirements to decontaminate the students after spraying them, instead leaving them to suffer the painful and debilitating effects of the chemicals as they dissipated. Police used chemical spray in 110 incidents in which about 300 students were sprayed, more than 1,000 students were exposed to the spray, nearly every student sprayed was African American. How can we not ask the question, why black lives matter? because this is less than humane treatment that we see happening to black children in spaces that are supposed to be for learning, affirmation, support, and development. I can go on, in 2010, a seven-year-old child, Lisa Hillman, was greeted by seven police officers, seven police officers, for quote unquote being disruptive. She was promptly handcuffed and led to a car where she was detained for 45 minutes until a caregiver arrived, seven years old. September of 2015, 15-year-old Maryland boy was arrested for kissing a female classmate at school. The boy told authorities he sneaked the kiss on a dare from other kids. Baltimore County Police and Baltimore County school officials responded with, quote, extreme alarm when, heard about the, when they heard about the case. The boy faces a second-degree assault charge as a juvenile for delivering an unwanted kiss to a 14-year-old white girl. Police also report that no one was injured in the incident, thank goodness. The school said that at a future date, they would determine to what degree the young boy would be punished. And we know this is not the first case. In 2014, a young six-year-old Colorado boy, black boy, was charged, with a, was charged with sexual harassment for kissing a girl on the hand. So this criminalization, policing of black bodies has become far too prevalent. It happens early, it happens often. And this goes against a larger backdrop of what we have to do, how do we respond? How do we push back? How do we make it apparent that black lives matter? And we should be unapologetic in making that claim that what is happening in schools to black children is hopefully unacceptable. So how do we respond? Number one, we have to think about how we put an end to juvenile, what I've referred to as juvenile injustice. Part of what we know is that we, have, we incarcerate approximately 65,000 young people in this country, young people in this country annually. And what we know that those folks are disproportionately black, Latino, and Southeast, Southeast, Southeast Asian boys. 
What we know is that black students made up 18% of students in public schools in 2010-2011, but were 40% of students who received one or more out-of-school suspensions. According to the Children's Defense Fund, a black child is arrested every 68 seconds in school. Black children are more than twice as likely to be arrested than white children. And while black children make up approximately 18% of all students in school, they make up 32% of children arrested, 40% of all children and youth in residential placements in the juvenile justice system. Part of what we have to recognize is that in the United States, the US juvenile justice system was just created and began to shift in the 1980s from rehabilitation to a punishment model. This model has created a broad sense of perpetual surveillance. It's created a broad sense of a state of conscious and permanent visibility where thousands of American young people, but especially young black children, are its primary focus. Where I'm at in California, we have invested more in the building of for-profit prisons than we have in institutions of higher education. Los Angeles County, Alameda County, the largest counties in California are bustling at the seams with young people. So now there is a, there is a, there's, the, there's the ability to make money on incarcerating black and brown bodies. Right? Part of what we have to recognize is that the exiling of American youth in the American justice system has dire personal consequences, economic effects. Some of the negative effects of young people include lower educational achievement, higher unemployment, higher alcohol and substance abuse, increased mental health problems, and higher rates of learning disabilities. Studies have also documented the high cost of incarcerating young people may not be most cost effective. When youth pay for crimes of being incarcerated, taxpayers also bear a huge burden. Locking up a juvenile in this country costs on average of $407.58 per person per day. And in some cases, when there's extreme expensive costs, it adds up to $148,000, $767,000 per year, according to a recent report by the Justice Policy Institute. The cost effectiveness of mass incarceration is being called into question. So while the numbers of incarcerated youth have decreased, the racial disparities have increased, where we see more black children being incarcerated. The Justice Policy Institute recently put the figure at close to $20 billion that's spent in the overall incarceration of young people in this country. So how do we respond? Part of what we have to understand is that this incarceration starts in oftentimes in schools. I maintain that what we have to recognize is put an end to police presence in schools. But we also have to understand literacy as a basic human and civil right. Because what we know is that, that literacy is proven to be one of the more essential elements to helping young people begin to defy the odds of what they see in oftentimes very oppressive schooling situations. So we have to talk about teacher quality to help us to use literacy as an opportunity to create opportunities that are different. We have to treat trauma. What we see is that oftentimes more black children are victims of trauma but have that trauma go untreated and so therefore the trauma is compounded that impacts their learning, act, their learning outcomes. So what I want to do now is turn to my third and final point to talk about how literacy as a form of, literate, of, of liberation, how literacy as a form of helping us to see a different way of how we do schooling. I maintain that we cannot keep doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different outcomes. We have to deal with police presence in schools, but we also have to increase the overall quality of the schooling conditions for black children. Because when we do that, then we can make the other argument about why police presence is not required. So I said I wouldn't bore you with a lot of statistics, but there's one that really disturbs me that I think we have to talk about. Uh, just three, four days ago, the NAEP data came out that looked at a number of different data across the board. And why I say that black lives and black minds matters because we look at the NAEP data, and you can raise questions about the reliability of some of the NAEP data, but it does give us a picture of what is happening in schools by racial and ethnic students. I share one particular slide which looks at reading scores. And I look at reading scores because reading scores tell us a lot about students' academic potential. I would go one step further by saying that reading scores tell us not only about students' academic potential, it tells us about their life chances as well. When students are not reading on grade level, by third grade, fourth grade, the likelihood that they will ever get on grade level is not very high. So when you look at these data here, and you look at the fact that black students have among the lowest proficiency scores by fourth grade. I'm a former elementary school teacher. I oftentimes said that I think in many ways, fourth grade is too late. By and large, we stopped teaching reading in second grade now. So when you talk about young children who are not reading in fourth grade, the likelihood that they'll ever catch up is not very good. 
And according to the NAEP data, we're talking about over 80% of black children are not where they should be from a reading proficiency standpoint. That is not acceptable. That is outright embarrassing. No nation should be happy with any group of its people having that kind of dismal set of reading outcomes. But what we have to think about, again, is a different way of how we do this. How do we change the narrative? How can we have a different approach to how we engage young people in literacy and learning so that we can help it make quite evident that black lives and black minds matter? So what does it look like? I want to talk about freedom schools. Any folks out here know about freedom schools? Can I hear you? Freedom schools matter. Freedom schools are important. Part of what we have to do is identify viable interventions, results-driven approaches that are moving the needle where black children are concerned. And I think that perhaps there's no other powerful model that we have today than freedom schools. Freedom schools, since 1995, have educated more than 135,000 pre-K through 12 children, and more than 18,000 college students have been recent graduates are trained within the Freedom Schools model. Now, the reason why I talk about Freedom Schools is because Freedom Schools embody a, an approach to teaching, thinking, and learning that we need to incorporate in our traditional schools. Because if we do, we don't have an officer Ben Fields in classrooms doing what he did to the young girl here. Freedom Schools offers a different approach to how we think about children, how we think about learning, how we think about growing. This is a literacy enrichment program designed to help connect young people to their histories, their stories, their narratives that tells them they don't have to apologize for being who they are. So what I want to talk to you about is that the work we've been doing the last couple of years around the goals of Freedom School, which is to do a couple of different things. You talk about high quality, high quality academic enrichment, social action and civic engagement. What we know is that the research tells us that when young people are able to deal with, examine, investigate issues that happen in their communities, their interest levels increase, their effort levels go up, and their academic outcomes improve as well because they are talking about issues that affect them. We lose too many young people in this country because schools don't connect to them. Schools are not relevant to them. Schools are not meaningful to them. So part of what Freedom Schools does is says, look, your history, your stories matter. You should learn about those stories. Embrace those stories. Celebrate your histories. What Freedom Schools also do is focus on intergenerational servant leadership development. Many of you in this audience know what this means, that we see it is an honor to serve young people, right? It is an honor to serve young minds. It is an honor to develop young minds. So see, if you're in that classroom in South Carolina and that child is being defiant, you don't think to call the police on her. You have to find out what's the root cause of the behavior. By some accounts, that young girl had recently lost her mother some time ago. So if a child is in trauma and she doesn't want to respond, you need to understand that what Freedom School says is you have to understand the entire picture of who our children are, right? Children are defiant for a reason. Children are hurting. Children are struggling, right? If you don't understand that aspect of who we are, you'll never make inroads with our children, right? What Freedom Schools also purports is that there needs to be a focus on nutrition, health, and mental health. Folks, what we have to talk about is that for far too long, there's been a stigma in our communities around mental health. Mental health issues are real. We should be unapologetic to say that we need to examine issues around mental health, right? We need to talk about it. We need to name it. We need to seek interventions because it is amazing what young black children are doing every single day without treatment. Can you imagine if we had treatment, right? There's no limit to how far black children would go if we had treat, treated trauma. What Freedom Schools does is put the focus on mental health to say it's okay to talk about having lost a loved one. It's okay to talk about the challenges of everyday life. We have to be unapologetic in the belief that when we help children become more mentally strong, that they can become more academically suitable for what we want them to do. And then that we also talk about parent and family involvement, which we know is an integral part of how we help support learning for all children. So what I want to talk to you about is that these four aspects, and folks who know Freedom Schools know what this is all about, right? Look, you walk into a freedom school, you see a different way of doing education. The child who oftentimes doesn't want to engage in freedom schools, he or she is engaging. They have four key components. One, you have to see this to understand the Harambe's. How many folks out here can connect to my Harambe's, right? It's a different way of engaging and learning. Kids start the day off with this 30-minute activity in which scholars, staff, and guests, everybody starts with singing songs and cheers and chants. And we get a moment of reflection to talk about what we're going to accomplish for the day. Right? We talk about something inside is so strong. This is what the kids say every single day to get their learning 
prepared, to get their minds right, to get their bodies in a position to learn. But we also know, within the context of Freedom Schools, there's an integrated reading curriculum. Scholars read culturally relevant books. I stress that again, culturally relevant books. Say it with me, culturally relevant books. Right? Again, we should not have our children constantly reading things that are not about them, stories that are not by them, history's not tied to them, okay? Part of what we also have throughout Freedom Schools is a whole, uh, an approach called drop everything and read, right? Where you stop what you're doing, you grab a book, and you read your book, and you read that book well, and you read for 15 minutes. It's created an environment that says that literacy is acceptable. Literacy is about you. You need to be unapologetic in that literacy. And then there's the point that ties into what happened in South Carolina. There's respectful treatment of youth. I'm going to say that one more time. Respectful treatment of youth. I'm going to say it a third time. Respectful, respectful treatment of youth. Right? <laughs> students are scholars. Students are seen as young people with promise and potential. We do not make any kinds of excuses for why students cannot be successful. The approach is that these four aspects of how we think and teach can be implemented in school. So let's talk about what we see. So the data we've collected have shown some things that are really beyond belief. This is a six-week program. We use a basic reading inventory to do pre and post on how well student progress unfolds over this six-week period of time. 2013, we see a 62% increase of grade levels that scholars experience from being a part of the Freedom Schools. 2014, 84% of the scholars saw an increase in reading proficiency. When students get to see themselves reflected, when they have caring educators, when they have a connection to what they're expected to learn, guess what? The learning improves. This is data that if we saw this in the public schools, we would be losing our minds, right? We'd be doing flips. We see 3% increases in public schools, and we're ready to call the media and everybody else say we're doing amazing work. Amazing work is taking place in freedom schools, yet we're not giving it the kind of attention that it deserves. But we also see you talk to parents, staff, as well as the scholars themselves. 87% of the scholars that we surveyed said that they are better readers now because of what they have done and learned in freedom schools. Parents said that their children are better readers because of what they learned in freedom schools. Staff say that the students who came to them are much more proficient, much more engaged, putting much more effort because of what they learn in freedom schools. Scholars' attitudes towards reading. This is 514 scholars we surveyed over the course of six different sites, two years. I see young Erin Hills in the audience. She helped collect some of this data just this past summer. Now we have freedom schools that are in probation camps in Los Angeles because we see that, unfortunately, far too many young black and brown bodies are in probation camps. Freedom schools are moving the needle there as well. These are kids that have oftentimes been written off, but yet we see that the levels of reading proficiency are increasing. Pre and post data tells us that students who are scholars who are in freedom schools saw that they had more enjoyable time reading, Think about this one. They look forward or hope that they would get a book as a present, right? They feel about like they're learning new things in their reading. They're interested in being good reading, readers, and they're interested in reading aloud, right? These are things that, by and large, we don't see in traditional public schools. And then we have a host of opinions about what students like best in freedom schools. And they go on about Harambe, motivates them, inspires them. They have time for personal reflection, right? It energizes them. Their favorite part of the day is when they get to sit in the circle time and talk about reading, talk about what they have read about and how it connects to their lives. Students talk about the teacher-student interaction. I'm going to say that again, the teacher-student interactions. What scholars told us over and over again is that, look, the teachers teach and treat you with respect. I keep coming back to that respect word again, OK? They also talk about the teachers make you want to learn. We need teachers at our regular schools like the ones we have in freedom schools. They care about you here, they respect you here, and they listen to you, right? See, we wonder about why students don't engage in traditional public schools because we have not told them that they matter enough. We don't have an ethic of care in place. In the freedom schools, there's a very different approach. The staff maintains, the, stu the scholars maintain that the staff is oftentimes friendly and care about their education. They see a connection between themselves and their staff. They're fun, they're nice, et cetera, et cetera. We asked about the complaints that students had about freedom schools. A lot of them said they didn't like the food. That's okay, because the food is 
a little healthier, so it means that's a little bit of a downside to it. But overall, most of the students said that they didn't, there was nothing that they couldn't think about that they did not like in the freedom schools. So here's a different approach to thinking, a different approach to learning, a different approach to literacy that makes this a civic, basic human right that all students should have, especially black children. We see schools are not doing their job in this regard. Now, we have lots of data where students elaborate further and further about they started reading more. The books that they read are enjoyable. Right? It actually made me think that reading is more cool because I actually never liked reading. Right? Reading makes me feel smart. We have a host of qualitative data where students are talking about the fact that and I'm in another grade level when I came here, so I know it works. Freedom schools make me a more confident reader. Since I've been coming to freedom schools, instead of playing video games or watching TV, I just sit down and read books now. Right? So part of what we have to do is move around from this, this, this pathology of black children that tells us that they don't want to read, they can't learn. Right? We know black children are more than capable of readers when you create the kind of environment, when you provide the kind of content that is stimulating, culturally relevant, and historical, historically accurate. So what we recognize, the scholars are saying that these kinds of spaces provide something different. Now, what are the implications? What does this all mean? I want to stress the idea that black minds matter. I spend a lot of time working with pre-service teachers, and I have teachers who tell me that, look, when I walk into a classroom, in a place like Washington, D.C., I don't see color, I see children. I'm colorblind. When I, when I hear that, I say, baloney, right? I had to catch myself there, I'm gonna say something else, right? <laughs> First and foremost, color matters, race matters. We have folks who will tell you that we are living in a post-racial period. Look, Howard, students, don't you let anybody tell you we're in a post-racial moment. You can't be post-racial till you've been racial. We have not been racial yet. We have not analyzed the way that race has a profound impact on the way that young people experience schools. So that's why we talk about black minds matter, because what we see is that schools are not adequately serving the black minds that are there. So we have to continue to advocate on how can we disaggregate data based on race? How can we see where black children are compared to their counterparts? And I would also argue we should not be in the business of comparing black children to white children. Because when you look at the data for white children, it's not nothing to write home about, right? Can I say it's not nothing? Can I use a double negative, right? But if you look at the outcome for white children, there's a lot, to, a lot of work to be done there. We should, be, we should be comparing black children to a standard of excellence across the board, right? That's what we have to put the focus on. We have to rethink who is teaching and monitoring black children. Look, the reality is this. The National S Center for Educational Statistics tells us that 85% of all classroom teachers are white women. Look, I'll say it again. 85% of all classroom teachers are white women. 40% of all classrooms don't have a single teacher of color in them. So if we're not willing to engage pre-service educators in the importance of cultural competence and racial awareness, we are never going to get children where they need to be. I think we need to have a freedom schools training model in many of our schools of education across the country because it will help these teachers understand what it means to engage black children in learning. If you look at the research by Etta Hollins, what she has found is that oftentimes, many of the white women who want to go into teaching prefer to go into teaching in the communities where they grew up in suburban areas. Nothing wrong with that. The unfortunate reality is that oftentimes there aren't jobs in those communities. So then you have a cadre of teachers who say, I need a job. Can't find one in the neighborhood where I grew up, so let me see where I can find a job. And guess where they go? Southeast, right? They reluctantly take positions where they're not really equipped to go. So we have to have a longer conversation about teacher quality, about teacher preparation, because I maintain the question we don't ask is not only are we looking at pre-service teachers, but who's doing the preparing of the teachers in the first place, right? <laughs> we talk about the shortage of teachers of color if you look at the, the, the number of teachers of color who prepare educators, it is outright dismal. Less than 2% of teacher educators are black, right? So we cannot talk about the teachers that we're sending out to look at the folks who prepare them. And then it's also about how we monitor schools. Too many of our young people enter schools where they have to walk through metal detectors. They're patted down just to come into school. So we have to look at who teaches and how we monitor black children. We also have to focus on this idea. Again, I'm going to keep coming back to literacy. Literacy matters. Literacy matters. Literacy matters. It matters. Listen, we need to put an intense focus on early childhood education for our children. Right? 
It is one thing when you've got a gap, when you've got a second grader who reads at a kindergarten level, that is a gap that we can close, right? One of the most painful things to see and hear is to walk into high school classrooms and see 10th, 11th, and 12th graders who struggle to read some of the most basic texts. That means we have failed those children. We have failed them when we watch children who walk in the classroom when they know they're not equipped. I was in a high school classroom in Los Angeles a couple months back, listening to these high school students attempt to read stories from a text that the teacher had been reading to them. And what was painful to listen to was how almost every student struggled to get through some of these basic sentences. That should be outrage. That should be unacceptable. And so this teacher engaged in this popcorn activity. She called on one student to read a sentence, and called on another student to read a sentence, and every student seemed to struggle. And finally, she called on this young man named DeAndre. She said, DeAndre, pick up from where we just left off. DeAndre said, I don't want to read. So I'm thinking, OK, she's going to call someone else. But on this day, in this teacher's infinite wisdom, she wanted to hear DeAndre read. She said, DeAndre, we need you to read where we just left off. DeAndre told her, I don't want to read. I'm sitting there thinking, OK, teacher, let's keep it moving, right? DeAndre told you he didn't want to read. Third time, she told DeAndre, DeAndre, we're not moving forward until you start reading. DeAndre told her, well, then guess what? We're not moving forward because I told you I don't want to read, right? Now, at this point in time, you know, it's like a tennis match. You hear what I just not said? I told you I don't want to read. At this point in time, I was nervous. I almost started reading just so we could set a break the, the nervousness, right? I was upset. What's going to happen next? Fifth and final time. She said, DeAndre, if you don't start reading, I'm going to send you to the office. What do you think DeAndre said and did? DeAndre went and politely got his backpack. He gathered his materials, put them in the backpack. He walked up very courteously to the teacher's desk. He waited for her to write out a referral. She called a student up to walk into the office, and DeAndre was then sent to the office where he was subsequently suspended for a day. Why was DeAndre suspended, you say? Because of subordination, right? Now, one of the things I often tell folks, I know I have a lot of future educators in here, one thing you never do is put any child, as you all say, on blast, right? You never put a child in a situation where you humiliate what he or she cannot do. DeAndre knew he could not read strongly, and that's why he told her very politely, I don't want to read. Move on. We have got to prevent those situations from occurring because we are sending far too many of our young people out there underprepared, underqualified. That's why black minds and black lives matter, okay? Student voices matter. Listen to what students say. Document what they see. We need to have students serve as curators of our stories, right? Control the narrative. Control the stories that we tell about us. I told you Dr. Thompson's legacy is that if we don't control our narrative, someone else will. Listen to students. Research students, hear what they say, examine what they feel, investigate what they hear. That is powerful. That's a change agent right there. We talk to all the adults all the time about education. My thing is, who would be the most powerful people to hear about schools? Students tell us a lot. They give us insights, right? And then I will say that millennials matter. That's the folks in this room, right? Because you have been able to navigate this process called education, not because of education, not because of school. I maintain oftentimes in spite of schools. You are oftentimes more resilient than you give yourselves credit for. You have shown uncanny promise, uncanny potential, because folks were prepared to write you off more so than you recognize. Much of what we saw in that South Carolina classroom, I'm willing to bet that many of you saw those same kinds of behaviors in schools that you attended. I'm saying we need you now more than ever. We need you to rewrite the narrative. We need you to talk about why black lives matter. We need you to be unapologetic in saying that black minds matter, because what you have to contribute can help change the educational experiences and outcomes of black children all across this world. So we need you. If you look at every movement that we've had in this country, guess who has led it? Young people, people who are unapologetic, fearless, courageous, willing to say the things that they didn't care what others thought about them. So that's why millennials matter, because at the end of the day, what we need to have is we need to think about a world where we reimagine what schools can look like. We need to reimagine places that are not going to allow young people to walk in by having to go through metal detectors, 
We want to reimagine a world that talks about the ways in which teachers, every teacher that every child has is qualified, culturally competent, racially aware, and sees every child in that classroom as if he or she is his or her own child. We have to reimagine schools as spaces that affirm, spaces that say we are truly, truly, truly interested in the outcomes of all students. We have to think outside of the box. We have to be deeply commit, com com committed and convicted to this idea that black children possess just as much potential and promise and intellect as any other group of students in this country. We have to reimagine something that other folks tell us is not possible. Understand, Howard University students, while you are amazing and you are great, understand, you stand on the shoulders of real giants. You are here not by accident. You are here because there are folks who sacrifice blood, sweat, tears, so that you would have this opportunity to be here today. Do not take that for granted. Do not let that sacrifice be in vain. Some of you are first generation to go to college. You are the prayers answered. You are the hopes realized. You are the dreams that have come true. That's why we have to reimagine a world where you are not the exception, but students like you become the norm. Far too many of our young people are asking for someone to care, someone to listen, someone to notice me, someone to say that I am important. That's why we need you. We have to reimagine a world that says that schools will be places that students are running to get into, not running to get out of. We have to reimagine schools being places where we don't have to have Ben Fields in schools that tell us that black lives don't matter, that treat children as less than human. We have to reimagine a space where learning and thinking are tied to one's own cultural experiences, one's own historical background. We have to reimagine schools as transformative spaces that give kids the opportunity to take risks and to think and learn beyond their wildest imaginations. We have to reimagine a possibility where children that we say we care about don't feel unprotected, don't feel the threat of police officers, and don't feel like at any moment they can be treated as less than human. So I need you all to understand that your lives matter. Don't let anyone else tell you that they don't. Your minds matter. Don't let anyone else tell you that they do not. We have got to be committed and connected to this idea that each and every child should be able to reach his or her potential. So with that charge, I ask you to be the best that you can be in all that you do. I dare you to be the best that you can be. And when we were growing up in Compton, we would say, not only do I dare you, I double dare you, right? And when the stakes got higher, we say, I triple dog dare you, right? I triple dog dare you all to be the best that you can be. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your attention. I appreciate your commitment to our children. So I was told to see if we had any questions and answers. If we have a few minutes for, for Q&A. Okay. There's a microphone here in the center. For those of you who are able to stay, we'll uh, take some questions. We have mics there. I imagine he was so clear, there's... <laughs> Microphone needs to be checked. Still check this one here. Nope. Yes, I can. Yes, you are. Uh-huh. 
So say the last part again for me, please. What can we do to get more funding for freedom schools? And increase the, so number one, I, part of what I think we have to do is um, increase the overall aware, m many folks have not heard of freedom schools, right? And, 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 and having conversations with Marion Wright Edelman, she has said in some ways that is by design because she feels like she doesn't want them to be co-opted or sort of to go mainstream, though I think you can make a strong argument as to why they could. But I think folks like yourself, products of freedom schools, have to talk about them, have to tell what you have gotten from them, how you've benefited from them. And I think we have to put the, 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 the pressure on philanthropic organizations to support it because what we haven't done, and that's why we're doing research on them now, is we haven't been able to document the results of what they've been able to accomplish. And we live in a data-driven world. And without any data su to support the impact that they're having, you're hard-pressed to find uh, the, kinds of, the kinds of supports from them. So I think we have to tell our story more. I mean, that's been a recurrent theme. And I think to get greater student participation, we have to in some ways tell students how this is different than traditional schools. I think some students feel like, I, I suffer through nine months of regular school. The last thing I want to do is go through more school. But if we help them to understand that freedom schools is something different, I think we are more likely to get engagement from, st from scholars. And as far as undergraduate students who play a vital role, as you know, in that process, I think, again, it's exposure and awareness that will help to uh, get more college students on the side of thinking about freedom schools as, as places to spend their summers, but also becomes a pipeline into teaching for many folks. And we're looking at some of our data now that's saying we're getting more African-American college students changing their majors, considering teaching after having spent a summer in freedom schools. That's encouraging to me. So awareness and money, awareness and money. I definitely feel like oh, I definitely feel like the money aspect is a big thing, because being a product of the South Side of Chicago, Wanting to like spread the information and wanting other people to be participants in the Chicago Free School, it's a lot of other things going on. The last thing kids want to hear is school, period. Yes. And the last thing kids want to hear is um, you need this education or you need this. But when you say money, yes, the kids are running to the, yes. the Freedom School. But the funding is really low, and mm -hmm. especially in, in areas like the south side of Chicago, it's yep. like yep. the funding needs to be other places. So when they hear like Chicago Freedom School, they be like, well, what about the school closings? And what about the schools who don't have like gyms and libraries? Yep. Yep. And yep. we want to put funding into actual schools. So what would you say to those who have the funding but rather give it to regular schools than Chicago Freedom School? Yeah, so, Freedom so schools? unfortunately it's not an either or, it's a both and. Because we know we have children who are in the traditional CPS schools, right? Right? So we have to put money there. But again, I think we just have got to do a better job of documenting why and how freedom schools are making an impact. Because if you do that, I think you have a much, much stronger leg to stand on to say we should be giving more money because folks will see that this is proven. I think if folks think that this is just a pie in the sky idea, folks aren't going to put money behind it. So we have to use results, results, results to make the case for more funding. Okay, statistics. Yes. Data. Thank okay. you. That's what you're going to do, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you so much Thank for your you. question. Dean Finrick and your team, I want to thank you for this opportunity for inviting our August Body speaker, Dr. Howard. As a student of the three B's of education, Charlotte Hawkins Brown, 1902, Mary McLeod Bethune, 1904, and Nanny Helen Burroughs, 1909. Can you unpack in the time that you have? I see the Journal of Negro Education. It would be remiss of me not to ask, what is the relationship or ships with the Negro History Journal, which was 16 years earlier by the inimitable, the sagacious Dr. Carter Godwin Woodson and his team. We can go on and name a number of other journals. And especially since Dr. Woodson was here for only one year. What is the impact of the Charles H. Thompson with those predecessors? And what is the legacy that you have profoundly laid out for us. 
as a teacher, an elementary school teacher, and as a freedom school teacher in Seattle, Washington, mm -hmm. nearly 48 years ago, would you help us with the context of journals and how an earlier journal has impacted upon us right to this very day? So I, if I can take a stab at that, I mean, I, what I would convey, I appreciate your question and your concern. Journals matter. Journals have been uh, arguably the premier outlet that scholars use to share their research. That research produces knowledge. Knowledge oftentimes shapes perceptions, popular thinking. Uh, knowledge helps to generate what people consume. And so it's important to be intricately, con intricately con connected to the work that's put out in the popular press, right? So what we understand is that so much of what contributed to the, 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 the pathology of how black folks here were sort of looked at oftentimes occurred through mainstream journals. You look at the study on craniometry, right? This idea that black folks have smaller brains than other folks do. That was all through, through academic journals and so-called rigorous research, scientific study that is highly, highly, highly questionable. So journals are important because they are connected to universities. They are connected to scholarship where lots of information is used to generate what we believe to be true what we believe to be evidence, how we understand how the world works. And if we're not able to, again, use the legacy of folks like Dr. Thompson, Dr. Carter G. Woodson, uh, Du Bois, uh, Julia Anna, Anna Cooper, all the other pioneers, Mary McLeod Bethune, those folks attempted to be, to offer counter narratives to what the mainstream media, mainstream journals, mainstream press were saying about us. That's why we've got to do everything we can to support our journals because they oftentimes help to tell our stories in ways, like I said earlier, are not told by mainstream journals. So yes, they're important. And, and ideally, and I'll, I'll, I'll conclude my thought with this, I think we've got to do a better job of connecting theory to practice where education is concerned. We've got to find a way so that all the important and incredible research that's being done in journals are connected or is connected to what happens in schools, what happens in classrooms. Uh, we have oftentimes a big disconnect between theory and practice, and I think there should be a two-way street. Teachers and practitioners and school leaders should be informing the research that we do, and the research that we do in institutions such as Howard University should also be informing the kind of practice and the kind of policy uh, that we see taking place in schools. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Our, our program has gone long this evening, so I, no, don't, don't go away. I'm going to, we're going to take one more question, and then we're going to adjourn to the gallery lounge for reception. And when we adjourn to the gallery lounge, you be sure to have a conversation with uh, Dr. Howard. Okay, one more question. Go ahead. Is the microphone working now? I think so, yes. OK, hi, how are you? Finding yourself. I'm good. So your presentation was very clear. Um, what I stick on is just like moving forward. Like we have the research. We have, like you said, all these theories, like moving on to practice and just the solutions. So as far as freedom schools, I don't know a lot about that, but I'm an advocate for community schools. So mm -hmm. my question to you is how do you feel about community schools? And especially, you know, as being Black Lives Matter, it's like how does that kind of connect. Yes, so I think there's a lot of overlap between community schools and what freedom schools are trying to become. Uh, where I'm at, at at UCLA right now, we're in the process of, of creating our second community school. Uh, this will be much more holistic in that it will have wraparound services. See, the problem we have not done is use the kinds of resources that we know that are on a campus and, and, and locate them on a school. So it, with this particular community school, what will happen is that we will have um, the School of Social Welfare, for example, has students who are working on MSW. So they have to do so many hours doing social work. So they will be located at that school. Uh, there will be a medical clinic at the school. It's taking all the resources that exist in the community and really have them kind of concentrated in a school setting where we know the students are oftentimes in need of those kinds of services. There will be a legal clinic that parents can access. There will also be um, 
Uh, there will be a, a clinic for, for job skill development for parents and caregivers who need that work. So the idea is take all those resources, put them in one place where the need is greatest, and see if that can help improve the educational experiences and outcomes for the students. Freedom schools are moving in that direction, and I think some would say there's a lot of overlap between what freedom schools are doing and what community schools attempt to do. But I do think we have to recognize, in short, that so many of the issues and challenges that, that black children have are oftentimes not um, solely within the confines of the school building. That until we can think about social emotional supports, mental health supports, uh, the kinds of things that I talked about earlier, we're not going to help our children get to their, their optimum level. So community schools attempt to do that. We have a couple models that are working uh, across the country. I'm familiar with one in Oakland, California that has been successful for the, for, for the past decade. The one we have at UCLA has had some, some really tremendous growth in the past five years. But the idea is you've got to have resources where children are. You can't expect children to go find resources. You can't always expect families to go uh, identify the resources. How about we bring those resources that colleges and universities have to schools? Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Before we adjourn to the, uh, thank you so very much, Dr. Howard, for being here at Howard. Thank you. <laughs> Before we adjourn to the gallery lounge for our reception, uh, Dean Fenwick has some final comments. 30 seconds worth, because you've said it all. Dr. Howard, we're deeply grateful to you for your incisive and um, self-determinative research and for sharing your commentary with us today. Your hashtag, um, Black Minds Matter, remind me of Howard University's first African-American president, Mordecai Wyatt Johnson, who said, it's worth, a it's worth applause, who said in the, in the 1950s, when he was addressing the Georgia Teacher Education Association, a group of black teachers, that what would resolve um, black brutality and defamation would only be black intellectual and political agency. And certainly your conversation with us today, your discussion, proves the validity of those words. So on behalf of the Howard University School of Education's faculty, staff, and students, we present you with the Crystal Apple Award. Um, this award is presented to individuals who advance the goals and mission of the School of Education to train reflective practitioners and engaged researchers. Thank so, you so thank much. you. Thank you. So much.